God said to tell the whole congregation of Israel, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. Let us pray. God of love, holy God, we ask for your spirit to be near on this sacred day. Help us, O oh God, to discover the ordinary holiness in our lives and help us to order our lives around those moments that we might be more whole, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have a riddle for us today, particularly the compromands, who have the slight advantage. <laughs> what do 150 ham sandwiches and brown bag lunches, 65 students wearing glow-in-the-dark face paint, four bonfires, and two dead squirrels all summer? <laughs> Anybody want to guess? Or you guys already know the answer? You know the answer? Anybody else want to guess? It's a very tricky riddle unless you've been with us. There are actually two answers to the riddle. The first answer is that all of these activities were a part of our confirmation curriculum this year, believe it or not. Secondly, all of these activities are strictly prohibited in the book of Leviticus. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 11 says do not eat or handle dead squirrels. It more specifically says don't eat animals that walk on all fours on their paws. Chapter 11 goes on to prohibit the preparation or distribution of pork on a ham sandwich on a bridges run, Gemma. <laughs> Leviticus 6 says to keep the sacred bonfire burning at all times to help mediate the presence of God, which we definitely did not do on bonfire nights or on our retreats for safety measures. Leviticus also prohibits marking your body with tattoos or modern interpretation glow-in-the-dark paint. So, the moral of the riddle is that according to Leviticus, we have utterly failed in our confirmation curriculum this year. But actually, I should say with the exception of the rule about eating the dead squirrels, we didn't do that just to make sure you get that note. And I should say, if you haven't heard the story about the dead squirrels, which most of you haven't, probably you should ask a confirmand who's on our retreat or a member of the, the Nazarelli Smelts family. They'll be able to fill you in on our adventures with squirrels this year. So how about an easier question? What is a belief or conviction that helps you order your life? Each year we ask this question of our confirmation class. But this year it has particular resonance because we're focusing on the often forgotten book in the Bible of Leviticus. I should also give the disclaimer here that every time we had a discussion on the Bible in our confirmation class, we somehow ended up discussing some obscure or even offensive text from the book of Leviticus. A hand would go up and say, but what about this part of the Bible? And so this, Will Streary, is my final answer to the question, what is the deal with the weirdest books in the Bible, including Leviticus? A, a large task. So let's imagine about 1,500 years ago that a group of detailed, if not OCD, Israelite priests get together and they pose the question, what are the beliefs or convictions that will help order our lives, our community? This is a particularly resonant question because they had just returned from 70 years in exile from their community in Babylon back to their holy land. And these codes were written shortly after their return. So after this return, from being kicked out of their home, the people had to reorient themselves. They were seeking a new system to organize how they would reach out to God and how God reaches out to them. They took this project very seriously, with detailed instructions from what they ate, to whom they dated, to what they wore, how they worshipped, and how they treated each other. One commentator compared the book of Leviticus, the codes of law, to a document that might come out today from the CDC, the Center of Disease Control, or the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. So these priests provided laws of sanitation and hygiene according to the knowledge of their day. And yes, many of these codes are not very relevant for our day. 
And yet, there are some fascinating and compelling arguments to keep the book of Leviticus around in our lives today. So first of all, the very first place is to start to unpack our baggage with this concept of holiness. God comes to the people and says, be holy as I am holy. And just to be upfront, I'll admit my own immediate reaction to God's call for me to be holy. Even as a professional, this feels unattainable. Someone telling me to be holy feels like a way to control me or my body or my relationships. Feels like God is far away. There's this complicated system of brownie points where you have to earn enough points to be able to be with God. Holiness codes make me feel stressed out about where I fall on the holiness meter. And in these days, and in the days back in the day when I misunderstood these codes, they also made me afraid to hang out with certain people who weren't on the same path to holiness as me. What if they messed up my holiness trajectory? But what if this is a superficial and gross misunderstanding of God's call for us to be holy? What if no. holiness is more about wholeness? Not about self-righteousness or moral purity, but about grace-filled action that makes us more whole. And what if there are imperfect folks like you and me who are holy because they bring others into more wholeness, more dignity? What if the priests were right, that holiness is woven into every day, into our mundane life? And what if there are messy moments in all of our lives that are actually sacred, like being with a person who's dying or drawing near to a person who's been discarded by our wider society? About twice a month, I go to the Newark Juvenile Center, basically a prison for kids who are some around your age. And when I go to Newark, I'm, I visit with a student named Kevin. And it can be, if I'm honest, awkward to visit with Kevin. It can feel vulnerable to walk into a prison. But the word I would actually use to capture our time together is holy. We visit, we play checkers, we learn about each other. I learn about the challenges of what it's like to be in jail. And we brainstorm ways to make meaning of our two hours a month together. This month, we decided to read a book and I challenged Kevin to make a friend, because with the social dynamics of the New York Juvenile Center, Kevin prefers to keep to himself. So from the outside looking in, you may be thinking, wow, these mentors are making a huge difference. But the truth is, there's something important, something that makes me more whole when I visit with Kevin in the prison. We talk about how to pray, we talk about school and food, how he passes the time, it's really mostly mundane, but when I leave, I feel like something holy happened. And this is not because I'm a do-gooder, pastor person. It's because he is a person of worth and intelligence and humor. And it is an honor, in fact, it makes me more whole to know and to visit with Kevin. One mantra that I always find myself coming back to is be curious, not judgmental. And this is particularly helpful in prison ministry or on our trips to Nicaragua or RISE because sometimes we bump into things that make us uncomfortable or they're new and we can jump to judgment. But the spiritual challenge is to remain curious, to recognize this is a different culture. We may not have all the information. This is also true when we read some of these ancient texts. Of course, we're free to criticize the interpretations of these texts that perpetuate suffering or oppression. But what would it look like to be curious about a book like Leviticus? What do we discover when we refrain from judging it as a book that's outdated or backwards? One amazing finding in my curious adventure is that this text is one of the first places that we go to find the modern mantra, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the text that Jesus points back to when he's asked about his favorite commandment in the whole law. Another fascinating finding is that in other ancient law codes of the day, they generally assumed that all free citizens would sort of look out for their own interests. It was primarily up to God or the judges to look out for the other people. That means for the Israelite community, the instruction to care for the vulnerable was a unique contribution. 
So you see, when we approach a new culture, whether it be Newark or Nicaragua or reading an ancient text, we can say, man, we do things more efficiently. We do things better than they do. Or we could ask, what wisdom is there here that can make us and our community more whole? Certainly to this day, we need the reminder to love God and to love our neighbor. And certainly, we still have a lot to learn about how to better care for the vulnerable in our communities. So, just like the post-exilic Israelites, sometimes middle school can be disorienting. It can be a time where your identity is shifting and you're grappling with questions like, who am I? Or there's constant social restructuring and you're asking, where do I belong? We obsess over who likes whom and the pressure of our discovering our passions, like lacrosse or basketball or drama or academics. All the while nagged by the question, even in eighth grade, are we good enough to get in the best college? What if we could come up with a system that would help us navigate those questions, a system that would help us become more whole? So here is our manifesto of middle school holiness, or I should say, middle school wholeness, loosely based on Leviticus chapter 19. First of all, God says, be whole as I am whole. When you love your neighbor, it's not a warm, fuzzy emotion. It's, in fact, an action which is at times uncomfortable. God says, leave extra abundance in your life as you go. If you have talent or money or material possession or creativity, use it to help others. You never know when you may be on the receiving end of someone giving a gift to you out of their abundance. God says, tell the truth. Now, this may seem simple or obvious, but let's be honest, many of our lives as adults and students are not 100% real. And if you're like me, we spend a lot of time on social media portraying our best selves. We don't post about our messy parts or our worst days. God says to... Find people in your life with whom you can be your real self. And I say, help us to build a church where we can be real together, where everyone knows that they are loved and cherished by God and by our community, no matter who they are or where they are on life's journey. Lastly, when negotiating these systems, it can be easy or tempting to push other people down in order to secure our spot in the hierarchy. But God says the most whole communities stand up for each other. God calls us to put ourselves at risk to protect the stranger and those in need. And if you're stuck, you can always go back to your own personal confirmation statement, which is in your bulletins. It's purple. You can take it with you today. If you're struggling to find meaning, remember everything happens for a reason. Stand up for those who are less fortunate, less resourced than you have been. You can always get better if you try. Do what is right, and then you will have no regrets. Go with your heart when you're faced with a tough situation. Love your neighbor. And remember that God guides your life. God is always with you. Lastly, I would add one piece of political wisdom, which is don't eat the dead squirrel. <laughs>